for it, Lord? You sure you don't want that one? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Research and Education Program Update. My name is Frank Lovetto. I'm the director of the museum. And welcome to a very special, informative presentation about the shark, SOFO Shark Research and Education work that we've been doing for four years now. I think this is the third SOFO Shark Research update in person. We did one during COVID for Zoom, right? We did a Zoom. So this is our fourth one. So it's really nice to get everybody back in person to this uh, to this program. Um, so we, we've been taking over, the South Fork Natural History Museum took over this initiative back in 2018, uh, but we've been part of the Long Island Shark Collaboration since 2014. And Greg Metzger caught the first shark that really put us on the map as a shark research uh, group. And then SOFO took over after OSEARCH helped us tag multiple white sharks in 2016 and 17, and then we took over the initiative till today. So uh, it's, there's been a lot of activity this, this summer. And the SOFO Shark Research and Education Update program uh, program uh, has reached a different status. We've reached the UK, we've reached global areas throughout the world that really didn't hear of us until this year because of all the stuff that's happening along the shores of Long Island and, and further west than that. So we've been on Good Morning America, Newsday front cover last Sunday. We've been on New York Magazine, Greg, Toby, Chris Paparo, everybody involved here has been really on the news and, and really we're really proud that our group has now taken that lead in educating the community and pretty much the world about what's happening here on, on Long Island and, and what's going on with shark activity in our ocean. It's a good thing. I just want to make that clear. I'm sure the panel speakers will talk about that. Um, because of conservation efforts that have taken place over the years that are enabling the, the oceans to be very healthy. So we're seeing more activity with whales, dolphins, sharks, and all it's relative to the food source that everything's eating now in the ocean, which I'm sure we'll talk about soon. Uh, so let me introduce you to uh, Dr. Toby Curtis, our lead biologist and one of the founders of the SOFO Shark Research Program. He'll introduce everyone and then we'll get the program going. So Dr. Toby Curtis, thanks for coming down. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. As always, great to see everyone. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming out. Uh, nice to see some familiar faces. Um, this is always one of the highlights of the summer. I'm happy to be here again. Um, so my name is Dr. Toby Curtis. I work for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, based in Gloucester, Massachusetts. Uh, I have a background in shark science mainly. I've been studying sharks in one capacity or another for over 20 years um, on the West Coast, in Florida, um, off Cape Cod. Um, kind of all over. Uh, but I went to college uh, at Southampton College, graduated in 2000, uh, a year, um, just a year after uh, Captain Metzger here and uh, a year behind Chris Paparo and a year or two behind Frank Quivetto. And so the whole like shark thing that SOFO is now a part of, um, it really kind of started at Southampton College in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it's just so cool to be back in this neighborhood doing research that we've all kind of we went our separate ways for a while, learned different, some different skills, and now we're all kind of back in our old, old stomping grounds doing this, um, doing some, some really fun research. So I'll, um, I'm gonna, I don't have a lot to talk about because I've done very little. I'm a desk jockey. My, my main job is, is monitoring fisheries, and um, I'm currently doing a detail with the Animal Telemetry Network, so I'm helping coordinate sh uh, shark and tuna and billfish and marine mammal uh, tagging and tracking nationwide, um, trying to co help coordinate the data and get that data to be shared um, for all kinds of different applications to help with conservation, fisheries management, and things like that. Um, so I sit at my desk, I look at a lot of spreadsheets, I write a lot of reports. Um, Greg is the one really getting all this work done. Um, so I'll let, uh, uh, I think we'll, I'll do a brief introduction, then we'll let everyone sort of give a minute or two about what they do. Um, but I've sort of helped coordinate, bring the group together um, and we're doing some just really unique um, and special science here in New York. Uh, some, some really, some new world first that, that Greg can uh, fill you in on shortly. So Captain Greg Metzger, he is our chief field coordinator for the SOFO Shark Research and Education Program and a high school teacher at Southampton High School. Um, we have, uh, yeah, please, please, Greg. He needs it. He needs it. Um, Caroline Wernicke from University of Delaware. Um, PhD student, she'll talk about her, her project. We have Captain Walt Zublionos, who's been a, a close friend and, and partner with the program uh, for a number of years. 
and a PhD student, Brittany Scannell from Stony Brook, who will talk about uh, some of her research um, locally at Stony Brook. So I'm going to hand it over to Greg to talk more about what he does and to recap this spectacular year that we've had with sharks so far. And I'm just, I just had my first day in the water today, had a blast, I got my butt kicked this morning, but <laughs> we had some luck. Um, so it's great to get some field time, get away from the desk, um, but I'm glad I could be here for this. Thank you very much. I'll hand it over to Greg. Thanks, Toby. Uh, so, yeah, so I, I um, my official title here is the Chief Field Coordinator for the, the research program. And it started out back in the early days, basically, I, I was the one that was conducting all of the field work. Um, we have thankfully added two additional very capable boats to our, to our fleet. Uh, starting out, we, we were chasing baby white sharks. And so the favorite line that I would hear often is, you need a bigger boat. And my response was always, I don't need a bigger boat. I just need more boats. And so thankful to Captain Matt Burkhout in the back of Stay Salty and Captain uh, Walt Suglionis. They, they both have spent tremendous amounts of time on my vessel uh, helping to uh, hone our craft out in the field, uh, catching and tagging and uh, handling these animals safely. And fortunately, they've gone on to purchase their own boats and have uh, access to their own crew now with the help of uh, Stony Brook, especially this year, uh, Mike Chacon over there, um, and so the the tremendous amounts of uh, additional work has has been able to come together this year. Um, I'm going to so basically what we do is we go into the field and catch and tag the sharks. So we provide the uh, means for Dr. Curtis and the other doctors or future doctors that are here to analyze the data and answer the questions. So. I don't consider myself a real scientist. Uh, I would consider myself someone that knows a little bit about catching sharks, but when it comes to the hardcore science analysis and analyzing the data and that that comes off of the tags that we do, that's not my wheelhouse, that's not my expertise. But what is great is all of the people that we work with in our collaboration stay in their lane. They have an area of expertise that is their wheelhouse, and each of us respect that and collectively working together as we do, we're able to have created a tremendous powerhouse of shark science that goes on here uh, each and every year. And so with both the University of Delaware and now the University of Stony Brook, and they'll talk about their work, you'll see how that complements the work that we've been doing here at SOFO. The work specifically here at SOFO uh, rely on two basic tags that provide the data that Dr. Curtis works up for the SOFO shark program. So I currently wear a lot of hats. I basically am going out into the field and, and targeting sharks. I'm trying to catch various species of sharks to um, put the various tags that we've been either contracted or are part of uh, the SOFO initiative. Our tags are uh, a cast cam, which I do not have to show you because we successfully deployed it uh, this afternoon before we got here, so I'm very excited about that. Um, the, this complements the world first, as far as we know, Dr. Curtis uh, just mentioned, because a few days ago, we, as far as we know, are the first people on planet Earth to deploy this type of tag on a sand tiger shark. The first in the world. No one has ever done this before. Uh, the shark team did it a few days ago. And so we were fortunate enough to get the, 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 the tag back. It worked. Uh, we have 10 hours of high definition video from the back of the shark, uh, plus millions and millions of data sets of uh, uh, the movement of this animal through the water. And we put it out, we, put, we got it back, we cleared it, and was able to deploy it again successfully this afternoon. So about two o'clock tomorrow afternoon, hopefully we'll have our second deployment, successful deployment on a sand tiger shark. So we're very excited. Um, this is that, that, so that's, that's like, I, I, I ended the movie before I started the movie, so, uh, but I'm super excited. So wh what's it look like this year? Uh, currently, we have 99 real sharks tagged. And I say 99 real sharks because if you include dogfish, we actually have 124 <coughs> sharks tagged. 124, what put that in perspective? Last year, I did 30 for the entire year. We're just surpassed halfway through the field season. We have 124 animals um, scientifically worked up. So we've been very, very busy. Um, 
So it includes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different species of sharks. And if the hooks didn't pop on a couple, we would that, that number would be 11 different species of sharks that we've had very, very close. So um, the, the other, some other highlights is uh, we were able to successfully catch and tag a small tiger shark, not a sand tiger shark, not a sandbar tiger shark, or any of the other names that are out there for these sharks. This is a true tiger shark. It's only the second one I've ever touched in my almost 20 years of and hundreds and hundreds of sharks to date. So that was a very special thing. The first one was before we were anything. It was just out of recreational fishing. And so this one we were able to do a full workup on. We have blood, we have uh, muscle biopsy, we have a pop-off satellite tag that's on it. It has not popped yet. So we're very excited to see where, where it is. We have a running uh, um, pool. pool to see where the tiger shark will, will pop. I'm saying it's close. Dr. Curtis says Martha's Vineyard. I don't know, what, what Stony Brook's guess? Would you guys throw a thing in the name and a half? In the pool? Yeah. Middle of the ocean. Middle <laughs> of the ocean. All right. And there's big dollars right on this. What is it? I think free beer or something like that? I mean, root beer. Sorry. There's uh, free root beers, I think, is what we're, what we're voting for here. Um, so it's been really, really amazing. Uh, as far as, uh, as if the field coordinator, I, I can't be more proud of all the work that's been done with, with the various captains. Um, we'll be interested to hear what Walt has to say and hear, hear his uh, take on it. Um, but certainly thanks everybody to, that uh, has, has been out there with us. So I think that's, that's a pretty, did I forget any highlights or updates? Just kind of putting it in perspective. You know, normally it's 30, we have 100. And so I'm very excited to get out there tomorrow. We had the 100th shark take the hook today, but um, it, it didn't, the hook didn't stick, so it popped off. So we're at 99. This, All is, right. this is just supposed to be the intro. Oh, this is just the intro? Before you go, I'll, stay, I'll, I'll come back and say that all over again. <laughs> Hi. Um, as Toby said, my name is Caroline Branke, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Delaware. And you guys might be wondering, why is this person from Delaware here to talk about sharks in New York? And I think that uh, Greg did a really good job summarizing that reason. Um, the sharks, the people, the facilities, and the really awesome work that's being done. And so my project is about trying to use sharks to help predict the weather. Um, we are hoping to deploy a new type of tag to add to your arsenal of tags um, that will pretty much take all of the sensors that you put and you see on like boats or underwater robots um, to collect water information and to shrink that down and put it in a tag and put those tags on sharks off the coast of Delaware, New York, New Jersey, and to take that information and put that into hurricane prediction models. So instead of using these sensors on boats, we're hoping to take advantage of our, our natural underwater submarines and send them out equipped with this device to collect that information so that we can do a better job at predicting hurricane intensity in the region. Um, and so um, initially we're looking at, we're trying to look at like, okay, which sharks are going to be good at this? And so um, Dr. Curtis was able to provide really useful information on um, some of those juvenile white sharks he was talking about. And it looked good with what we were, our, our criteria of a, a good uh, hurricane monitor. And so we're hoping um, this next summer to take some of these tags and put them out here on juvenile white sharks, um, possibly spinner sharks, blue sharks, and short fin makos. So we'll, instead of putting out a glider or a boat, we're gonna deploy the sharks and just with where they go naturally and how they dive and surface, um, they're able to collect that information for us. And it's really exciting because it's kind of a two-way street. Um, on the one hand, we're getting this water temperature information and we're able to use that to help coastal communities and improve prediction times. But we're also getting a lot of really good information on where these sharks go. Um, these tags, in addition to getting temperature and salinity, are recording position and you know where they are and when they're there. And we can use that to sort of help us help them help us. You know That, that information can help us with management and can help us with predicting behavior. Um, and as we said, you know, like helping to ensure we've got healthy oceans from the top to the bottom. Um, so thank you.
Do I have to stand? <laughs> um, so my job is very different than everybody that you've heard so far. Um, I'm not a scientist, although I do analyze data by day. It has nothing to do with sharks. I'm a software engineer, um, but this is my passion. Um, I've wanted to do this forever, and um, I started doing this with Greg probably 10 years ago, and it took off, it, it slowly progressed. We started taking more and more sharks, then the great whites came into the picture. And one of the things that really um, interests me about what we do is he did something very different that most fishermen don't do, and that's bring kids out onto the boat, bring interns, young people that have never done any of this, that are very interested in it, but have no opportunity, really. I mean, I, as a kid, I would, have, I would have lost my mind to be able to get out on a boat and go out with a shark fisherman and actually see a shark in the water and, and catch it and touch it and see some scientist work it up and take blood. I mean, I can't imagine how, you know, a kid, what impact that would have in a child. So that is one of the big things that, that kind of drove me and motivated me to, to stick this out and to buy my own boat, put a lot of money and effort into this, and it is all worth it. I mean, it, it's all worth it. Um, you guys, you know, I hope we inspire you, you know, the kids out there. That's the, that's the most important thing because, you know what, we don't live forever. And we're not going to be here forever. So we need you guys to take the reins eventually. And uh, so what we're doing out there, like Greg said, you know, the numbers of sharks that we've tagged over the years have slowly increased. Um, this year, they're actually a big jump. Um, and that's great because that's more information for the scientists. You know, although we're out there and we're not scientists, we're doing a very important part, and that's getting data, right? Capturing this data that's, you know, it's very, it's very hard to capture. It sounds easy. Well, you just go out and catch a bunch of sharks. Well, first you gotta find them, then you gotta catch them. And my, the biggest part of my job is not only finding them, I fished on Long Island my whole life. I grew up in Island Park, I lived on the water, I've watched fishermen catch sharks my whole life. Um, to see, to be a part of this is great, but, to see the, um, the sharks come in that we're, we're catching now and be able to tag them. There's so many different nine species this year. Um, and I know we've done more over the years. We saw a, a tiger shark years ago. Now we finally saw another one, probably like five or six years later. Um, so it's, it, there's no, you know, well, we're just gonna go catch these sharks and here they are and this is where we go. And it's not that easy. Right? So my job is to find the sharks, and also a very important part of my job is to keep people safe. You know, like kids and you know, other people that come out, my job is to keep them safe. You know, Greg and I, like Greg said, you know, we've been doing this for years. We've honed the skill of catching a shark. It's very easy to catch a shark when you're a fisherman and kill it as soon as it's in eyesight. You know, we have a, 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 we have a thresher that's 14, 16 feet long. The tail is deadly. You know, to just to be a fisherman and take a harpoon and kill it, it's, that's simple because you, there's no danger. It's, it's at a distance, you kill the fish, you're done. You haul it into the boat. Well, that's not our job. Our job is to bring it to the boat safely, don't harm it, make sure we don't get hurt, and put a tag on it at the same time. So it's a lot different than what fishermen do on a daily basis. To research these things, to keep them safe, to keep ourselves safe, that's a tremendous job. And it takes a tremendous effort and a lot of experience. So I don't, I don't, you know, people ask me, well, you know, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna go shark. Don't take it so lightly. It's very easy to catch a shark, stay away from it. You don't know what you're doing, just cut the line, let it go. That's what most people, I know there was a famous, there was a video that went viral like two weeks ago. Uh, a guy was out with his kids and he caught a shark, I think it was all the Carolinas. He reached down to take the hook out and it took his pinky off. You know, it's very dangerous what we do. So the number one job, and you know, Brittany will tell you, it's all about safety. We practice, before we even get a shark to come to the boat, we practice and practice how to tail rope, how to take the hook, how to handle that shark. Before everybody has a job, right? There's four of us on the boat. We already know before we get a shark, we know who's, who's gonna pull it in, we know who's gonna tail rope it, we know who's gonna you know, grab that wire and hold that wire. The most important part is where that jaw, you know, the teeth are. We want to keep that away from everybody else because some sharks can bend down, bend around, and grab their own tail if they want. So that's basically what I do. I find the fish, I keep everybody safe, and uh, and and I enjoy every minute of it. So.
bring that power from offshore onshore. We have a large five-year project that we're going to be working with SOFO for the next five years to tag every single year 125 animals. So that's, it's 100 sharks every single year. So we're focusing on duskies, sandbars, sand tigers, and Dogfish? And dogfish. Yeah, dogfish. They're, they're, not they're not real sharks. sharks. <laughs> they're not a real shark. You think about real sharks. Right. Um, <laughs> so that means we have this really great opportunity here because most of the offshore wind farm research that has been going on has been only looking at post construction. So we have this opportunity now to kind of look at the beforehand and before they run those cables to see if any of that moving electrical current which will be buried underground and produces EMF, which sharks are capable of detecting, is gonna have any effect on the movement. So that's kind of been the real big driver. And then that works in conjunction with my personal PhD project, which is New York has a system of offshore artificial reefs. There's 12 of them. And so to kind of see and inform artificial reef management in the area to see how these sharks are using the habitat. But we have so far, uh, tagged, worked up 124 sharks, so we've already been getting results. The way that we're personally tagging these sharks is we use acoustic tags, which are slightly different than some of the satellite tags and the CATS cams, so we internally use surgery to implant these tags. So there's a team, we have Lucas, we have another uh, research tech, Brianna, and my professor, Brad. So we've been going on out with Brad and Greg and Walt and Matt as much as we possibly can to kind of just tag all of these sharks, um, taking fin clips and muscle biopsies and blood um, every, every as often as we can. And we've, we've already detected uh, 13 of the duskies so far. So we're seeing them, we're getting the data already, which is great. Hopefully more to come. Do, do you want to just maybe just go over quickly like what each of the samples are kind of going or doing? Is that yeah. gonna be able to do that? Yeah, I yeah. think that might be important. So these acoustic tags, the way that they work is we place receivers all along Long, Long Island. Stony Brook as a whole in university has over 162 receivers out. And so these receivers are always listening for the tags that we place in fish and sharks. They are surgically implanted in the body cavity of the shark. So it's a, a quick incision and then a couple of sutures and the tags last anywhere from five to 10 years. And they're always continuously sending pings out. So whenever a shark or a fish swims within 500 meters of a receiver, we get a notification that says, OK, there was a shark detected here at this time. And then we also get the depth that the shark was detected at. And then so along with that, we are using the fin clips for genetic samples. Um, we're using muscle biopsies for stable isotope analysis to kind of further look at the diet of these sharks. Uh, the blood um, we'll kind of use for more, more. Um, I think we're going to be looking at toxins in the blood and mercury levels. And then we're taking fecal samples to hopefully link the diet to the movement of the sharks to see are they using uh, offshore artificial reefs as places to forage and look for food. So that's kind of the whole picture that when we have a shark at the boat, we're answering all these amazing questions. Great thing for Dr. Merchant, Mike Shields has another job. Those receivers, they actually sit at the bottom of the ocean. Yes. What are right? receivers? They're receivers, they're little, they're machines that when a shark that has an acoustic tag in it, if it comes within a certain range, it picks up that signal and it knows that shark was in that area. So, so it's like the, 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 the little uh, things where you can find the sharks and put your well, we don't so much need it to find the sharks. We just want to know how many sharks and when they pass by a certain area. But the point of, I was trying to make is that Brittany actually places those receivers also. She's a diver. She goes down off the boat, 
puts them in the, at the bottom of the ocean with a big chunk of cement, and then has to, they have to go get that data too. It doesn't magically appear on your phone like everything else. Full you have to actually go get it. So she does a lot, a lot of work. It's, it's basically an easy pass system for sharks. Yeah. Every yeah, shark exactly. has, has got an easy that's pass a good tag. Way, that's a good analogy. And, and so these, the receivers sit in one place, and when the sharks have their unique you know, easy pass code, when they swim past it, they get a beep. It gets logged on the receiver, and then, yeah, Brittany has to go and dive and get it off the bottom, <laughs> plug it into a computer, and then we get, you know, six months later, three, six months later, you get, you know, thousands and thousands of detections all, all at one time. Yeah. Question. Yeah. 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 yeah, so the way that you design your array really depends on the question that you're trying to answer. So for the wind farm questions that we're looking, we have them set up in, it's called a VPS, a Vemco positioning system. Mm -hmm. So each receiver can hear the sharks, but it can also hear the other receivers around it. So that allows us to triangulate the position of a single shark in that array. So we know that exact X, Y position and along with the depth. So you can really get kind of a fine scale image of how that shark is moving in that area. And then when we're looking at things like the artificial reefs, we set them up in areas. Specifically, we make a lot of boxes. So we have the area of the artificial reef covered. We know when they're coming to the artificial reef, how long they're staying on the reef, and then we can also look at the connectivity between the reefs, how they move from place to place. I have a couple of cool questions. What's our typical fish out here? Shark mostly? And how far out are they? I don't feel endangered when I swim distance, but my friends say I shouldn't do it. And the other thing is, could you speak to the relationship between dolphins and sharks? Uh, so this time of the year, the number one shark that's probably in our waters are the smooth dogfish, which are completely harmless unless you're a crab. So um, I, the, the second to that, it re, there really is a big change in shark species and numbers as you move from uh, Nassau County to Montauk. Uh, so the most sharks that we've caught and tagged out of the 124 are actually dusky sharks. I think we have almost 60 dusky sharks um, they're many. yeah they're about they're about uh, three feet long uh, but but we've been fishing west uh, out out here I, I the number of dusky sharks that are out here are nowhere near what we see see farther farther west um, so you know if you're in the water you are probably within sight of a shark you're not going to see it because the water is is not as clear and they're excellent at camouflaging and and avoiding detection um, just to put things in perspective for all the craze this year uh, the sharks that are typically in our waters show up mid-may so i want you to think about the number of people that have been in the water along the south shore of Long Island from the second week in May until today. How many people have been in the water from the middle of May till today along the entire south shore of Long Island? But it's not just the number of individuals, right? I hate the beach. The only thing that brings me to a beach is the dead shark. But there's lots of people that love the beach. And so, I'm not kidding. Uh, they, you know, an individual may go to the beach, they might go in the water, and then they come out of the water, and then they go back in the water, and they come out of the water. So it's not even just the number of individuals that have been in the water, it's the number of times a person has been in the water along the south shore of Long Island from the middle of May till today. It's tens of millions. Agreed? Yeah. How many of them had a bad day? Six. All this shark craze that's dominated New York and the world, as Frank pointed out, we've been interviewed by international newscasts, is because of six bad days out of tens of millions of opportunities. So when you hear the statistic, your chances of being bitten by a shark are almost zero. More people die from bee stings, but the, that is literally what we're talking about. If you take a calculator and you take six divided by 50 million, you're going to get almost literally 0%. That's what this is all about. So go swimming, 
But you need to educate yourself on when to go swimming. If there's a large school of fish in front of you, don't go swimming. If you see lots of dolphins, your first thought should not be, ooh, let me get on my paddleboard and go have a dolphin swimming experience. If you see whales, if you see osprey, if you see seagulls, don't go in the water because they're all there feeding on the same thing that the sharks are there feeding on. And primarily this time of the year, it's the Atlantic menhaden. So if you don't see that activity going on, if you don't see anything in the water, or anything happening in the water, then your chances are reduced compared to if you did see that stuff going on. So we need to educate ourselves on interacting with a more conserved ocean, which is, is the only reason all of this stuff is going on. Are there more sharks in our waters? Yes. For all intents and purposes, according to the good doctors that are out there studying this stuff, all indications are that the positive conservation efforts that have been in place for over 30 years are starting to work. We are starting to see more sharks because of positive conservation efforts. But we're also seeing more food in our waters. So these spinner sharks that we're seeing, most of them are adults. They've, they've probably been alive for, I don't know, 25, 30 years. Why are they all of a sudden in our waters in more numbers? Because it's worth it for them to swim all the way from Florida to feed on our bunker that are here. So we're seeing more food, which is bringing more sharks. But yes, there are more sharks also. So that's really what all of this is about. When you step back and take a look at the numbers, it's six out of tens of millions. You have a better chance of getting hit by a lightning bolt right now than you do getting bit by a shark as long as you swim safely. Yeah, you had a question about dolphins? As far as what? Dolphins, do What's they interact with sharks? Dolphins. Well, do dolphins don't care, sharks don't care. We've had, we've been out there fishing and sharks are around. We've had a number of sharks around the boat. The dolphins come through, they don't care. It's like, you know, do you care thing. if there's a person online with you at 7-Eleven? No, it's the same thing. They're both getting the same thing. They're right. getting food. Yeah, the dolphins. And that's it. And the, they don't the, care. It's, it's the not food. like TV, you know, oh, the, sh the dolphins are going to kill the sharks. That's not real. That's not real. I mean, um, that's not what we see. We don't see that. Don't see I, I don't, you know. Are sharks not turtle? Good question. Thanks. It, it depends on the shark. Um, most sharks, um, most sharks we have around here are actually visual hunters, so they do feed during the day, but they're also active at night, so they're, they're kind of both. Um, some sharks are a little more active at night because they can ambush their prey more easily, but uh, most sharks, they, you know, they need their eyes to see, so they need a little bit of light, so most of the sharks around here, they, they kind of feed around the clock, and I think they probably do a little more feeding during the daytime, um, and they might actually be a little more amped up at dawn and dusk and that's why we often recommend you know if you're concerned about safety it's, it's best not to swim at dawn or at dusk when the light level is is kind of lower um, because that gives the sharks an advantage where they can still see their fish or whatever they're gonna they're, they're chasing why do, sharks feed in the morning? why do they feed in the morning so when the sun comes up yeah they're of course they want their breakfast um so the uh when the sun first comes up the sharks can see better than their fish the fish prey most of the time um, that's what we think. And so they're more aggressive, they can, they can hunt more effectively um, and get more food when the light level is low. So right when the sun comes up, they have an advantage over their food. And so that's when they like to eat. Okay, I think we have more sharks. Oh, so any of these uh, sharks, do you know, do they go into the bays or do they stay <coughs> only in the ocean? I mean, are there no, any inclusive We, have, we have a test, we have a test kit. <laughs> They'll tell you if there's sharks in the water. <laughs> you may have seen. Yeah, you just, you just take a spoon. You can make it yourself. This test kit. <laughs> you take a spoon. You can dip it in the water, and if it tastes salty when you taste it, there's a good chance that it could be a shark. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so to, to answer your question, and the, I do get this question a lot because people, uh, you know, have the false sense of security that sharks are only found in the ocean. And I can tell you from our tagging data and from personal experience in catching and seeing that these sharks really don't care about bays versus the ocean. So uh, Dr. Curtis and I, there was uh, a few years ago, there was, uh, we identified a basking shark. So this is the second, the second largest shark in the world was seen by uh, some uh, pictures from a dock and from a drone. And it was in like, 
four feet of water way deep in Shinnecock Bay uh, by, by in Quag. Uh, we have fishermen that have caught uh, spinner sharks in the bay. We've had Stony Brook students that have caught thresher sharks in crab traps. I mean, so, um, you know, we've, we've had dead adult sand tigers wash up, wash up in, in the marshes in the bay. So um, we've had positive, uh, so Brittany explained the acoustic tags and how they work with the, the easy pass. And so we've had one of our white sharks was caught on one of these receivers in the Great South Bay, deep in the Great South Bay. So this was probably a four or five foot white shark. So, um, you know, the, the, there are, I, I would say there are more animals in the ocean, but all of these animals, we have confirmed identification in the bay. So I would just add that um, the, some of the bays are actually nursery habitat for some of the shark species. So they're, I would say generally they tend, they tend to be smaller sharks. So sand tigers, we have large sand tiger sharks offshore. The ones, the sand tiger sharks that occur in the bays are generally smaller. Um, I think it seems the same with the spinner sharks, potentially dogfish. So uh, almost all of these species occasionally kind of poke their nose into the inlet and check it out. Most of the bigger sharks really prefer full strength salt water. They don't like any freshwater inflow. Um, but the juvenile sharks are much more tolerant, or a lot of the species are much more tolerant at small sizes of estuarine water, and they actually prefer the estuaries for their nursery habitat. So, um, you know, I, I just want to give the impression that there's a lot of, like, full-size white sharks that, that get into the bay. That's not the case. It's, uh, it's usually, usually juveniles, but a lot of the species do occasionally kind of poke in, and, and some stay in the bays more resident than others. And keep in mind, that basking shark doesn't eat anything but little tiny shrimp so you know even though it's one of the biggest sharks there's no danger from a basket shark yeah no I because when he said it's one of the biggest sharks yeah I know a lot of fear comes into a lot of people so yeah it, it won't hurt you at all it can't so kind of going off that point I'll just expand a little bit it, um, we've talked about all the different species of sharks it, it matters um, what the species are we, we, you know, we, the, the headlines are always just shark sighted here, shark sighted there, a shark bite happened. There's no, the media doesn't differentiate between any of the sharks. You know, we've, we've seen a dozen species, um, you, sample, you know, caught 10 or 11. Um, there's a dozen species that are very common in New York, and some are potentially more dangerous to swimmers, swimmers than others. They have very different ecologies, very different migratory patterns, very different habitat preferences. These are the things that we're trying to study. We're trying to study you know, where the sand tiger shark hangs out versus the white shark versus the fresher shark versus the mako. They're, they're very different species. They hang out in very different places. They have very different behaviors. And diversity of the shark population is really important. It's a sign of a healthy environment. But it's just important to, have, to try to keep that nuance in mind. When you hear sharks are dangerous, that's not the case. There's over 500 shark species. About 30 out of the 500 have ever bitten a person, as far as we know. Um, uh, when you hear, if you hear somebody say sharks are endangered, also not true. Again, there's 500 species. About a third of them are considered threatened uh, worldwide. And in some some places, like the U.S. Atlantic coast, they're doing better than uh, than other parts of the world because we've had this um, this, this conservation and fisheries management uh, for over 30 years now. And so it's um, it matters. Um, look, think beyond the headlines. Don't you know when you hear sharks do this or sharks do that or sharks are dangerous or sharks are endangered. It matters what species you're talking about and where um, where you're talking about them. So uh, it's it, I think I find it fascinating the biodiversity here in New York. I think we're among the first to really take a hard look at how many different sharks are actually out there, how many different species, and it's um, it's it's mind-boggling to me that we have access to so many of these species on a regular basis. I, and I'd just like to piggyback on that and and give the museum the accolades that that they deserve in that respect. Most of these uh, most of the shark research that's happened so far on Long Island um, was very restricted in the species that they were able to uh, study. And typically because uh, these organizations get grants which fund a specific narrow question to be answered and oftentimes it's focused on one or maybe two individuals. The museum, thanks to Frank's leadership, um, really embraces the fact that uh, we have access to all these animals and when a tiger shark shows up the first question is heck yeah take that thing we need to learn about it 
you know, so we, the museum has given us, the, the SoFo Sharp Research Team, full autonomy to make decisions literally on the fly. Uh, we could go out tomorrow and, and catch a bull shark. I've never seen a bull shark, I've never caught a bull shark, but I know that uh, we're armed with PSATs, and as long as the good doctor says it's worth it for us to uh, collect data on a bull shark on Long Island, uh, I, Frank's gonna be, you know, high five on us at the end of the day. And so the, the leadership and the confidence that uh, Frank has in the shark team really allows us to, to take on this task of catching and tagging a dozen different species of sharks, which other organizations don't have that latitude. So thank you for your continued support and keeping the museum alive, and thanks for the yeah, leadership. Here we go, the only question over here, she said, I've been here for quite a long time with the shark hat. What type of shark was like the most common that you've caught this season? Yes, so the, 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 the dusky shark is the one that we've caught the most of. Uh, we have uh, what, almost 60 of them caught and tagged so far. And there, there's those dusky sharks we're catching. They're small, they're very small, but that doesn't mean they stay small. They do grow quite large, but we are catching small ones. They seem to be just small around our area. What small? Three, yeah, four feet. Right. Yeah, about three, four feet. Yeah. Yeah. So the evening when I walk on the Mekong Beach over there, we see at least 10, 15 dead, I think they're dog fish. And sometimes one or two, in fact, alive, and I try to push it back in the sea. <laughs> um, is it because there is a real, I mean, not a, a real shark which scares them? They come, or why suddenly some evenings have so many on shore? And what the best to do when they're not dead or attacked by the seagull? Is it to push them back? <laughs> yeah, to the that's sea? a good thing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, if they're alive, it doesn't hurt to give them. An, if you feel safe enough, comfortable enough to do it, just sure give them a toss back into the ocean. Yeah. Um, it, there's a number of reasons uh, to that that kind of thing could happen. We hear we get reports like that up and down the coast of sharks on the beach. Sometimes they're alive, sometimes they're dead. Dogfish occasionally have uh, the experience, sort of like fish kills. Um, an area can be it, it could be any number of things. Sometimes there's low oxygen in the water, and uh, or there could be an algal bloom, and it, it and they wash up, they they die, they suffocate, and they die. Um, sometimes it could be fisheries bycatch, so they were caught by by fishermen offshore and then they're tossed over and they kind of wash up on the beach. Um, and there's also been cases of actual um, disease, like, vi um, like bacterial or viral outbreaks, and it, it spreads through the dogfish population and they get sick and die in large numbers and wash up on the beach. So there's a number of things. Um, the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, the DEC, they actually have a shark reporting program, a shark spotter program, and if you see something like that with a large number of sharks, you can call the state and alert them to it, and they might be able to send biologists out to collect samples and try to find out why they died. Yeah, so just to piggyback on that, if um, any shark that you see, whether it's alive or dead, if you're able to get a picture of it or a video of it, mm -hmm. you can report it, and it's, in, it's encouraged to report to the New York shark spotters. So um, if you have a smartphone and you've gotten your video or your picture, or you just Google New York shark spotter and you'll the the website will come up there's a QR code and you you have to I think you have to download an app or something like that or they, they make it fairly easy for you to report uh, sharks it's useless without a picture so if you if you don't have a picture or a video and you just say oh I saw a shark fin um, I, I give a whole lecture on uh, shark identification, what you can and cannot tell, and so um, so that that's something that's very very important is it, you know to report to the New York Shark Spotter, but make sure you have have good pictures or and or video. Why don't you like dogfish? <laughs> I, I have some friends who'd be very upset if I didn't say dogfish are sharks too. They're a particular family of sharks. They're historically have been very, very abundant. A lot of fishermen consider them a pest. Some fishermen even at this table might consider them a pest. Um, but just because they're small, they're very abundant. They're not as charismatic, I would say, as some of the larger shark species around. Um, I like dogfish. I don't hate them. Um, I don't necessarily love them either. Um, I think they have a special place. They're very, they're very important sort of mid-level predators. Yeah. 
So they're, they're important to the environment. You know, we think of sharks often as apex predators. There's most sharks are actually in the middle. They eat crabs or, you know, small bait fish. And, and they're the, in turn, they are food for bigger sharks. Sand tiger sharks, um, spinner sharks, probably definitely juvenile white sharks. They love to eat little dogfish. Um, so they have their role to play in the ecosystem too. So uh, I don't, I don't knock the dogfish as much as some others do. Yeah, uh, I, I think I think that's true. I, I just like I don't really like dogfish, but I, <laughs> they are they are an important ecological role. And uh, so I think I think I have twenty. I think I have about twenty five or twenty six sand tigers that I've caught so far personally myself, and uh, a handful of them in the struggle um, regurgitate. Dogfish, so it is. It is. It is an important food source. Um, there's confirmed video of, of baby white sharks uh, chasing down dogfish. So, uh, as much as I think they're a pain in the neck in terms of Mother Nature, they are a really important uh, shark here here on Long Island for the reasons Dr. Curtis said. So my question is, uh, do you think that the near shore area is really a nursery ground because you're catching these smaller animals? And then kind of a related question is, do you tag offshore to try to get the older ones or in certain locations where you get bigger and older animals? Uh, so our, our work here at SOFO has confirmed that the south shore of Long Island is a nursery for white sharks. Um, that, was, that was a question that really Dr. Curtis threw on my table when I first started to actively go out and catch and target sharks. So we, we have confirmation from our work here at SOFO that that's true. Uh, the New York Aquarium has confirmed that the Great South Bay is a nursery for sand tiger sharks. Uh, so their work has confirmed that. Uh, I don't know of any other confirmed nurseries here on Long Island, but we just see a lot of juvenile sharks. We, we definitely yeah. see a ton. I mean, I'm sure that we could, uh, you know, we see a lot of, uh, you know, these little tiny dusky sharks. Um, there's, there's a lot of evidence that small thresher sharks have, have been, are caught, uh, I, I caught one, but there's a lot of evidence, you know, online and stuff like that. So the, the New York bite, which is, is, includes the South Shore of Long Island, is a very, very important productive part for, for these typical shark species. I mean, that, the, the tiger shark that we saw today, that was a juvenile, it was only six feet long. I mean, a six yeah. foot shark is still, you know, it's a big animal, but when you get, 18 feet long, a six footer is, you know, barely, barely, you know, can read or write type thing. As far as going offshore, the, the species that we're interested in, um, we don't need to go offshore. I don't know what your definition of offshore would be. 20 outer miles shore, outer shore. Outer, yeah. yeah no, so <laughs> none of our boats are capable of going there. Um, <laughs> None of our boats are really capable of going that far, and the species that, that this team and our collaboration are interested in are, are all found within 10 miles of the beach. And yeah, that would require a lot more funding. <laughs> question is, why did you select sharks to study? Oh, I, I'm going to pass the mic down. Let's, yeah. let, let's start with Brittany and we'll work our way up, I would say. <laughs> Great question. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Carol. So actually, I come from a background of seagrass. Um, the lab that I, I work in is, is mainly a community ecology lab, uh, and I started working there in undergrad. And you know, bay scallops, seagrass restoration, a lot of inshore stuff. And so once we moved offshore with a lot of the artificial reef work, we started out putting receivers looking at uh, blackfish and black sea bass and looking because those are reef associated fish that fishermen are always really interested in recreationally here on Long Island but when we put our first receiver out we got it back and we saw that there were hundreds of different sharks that were also popping up on these receivers so from there that kind of started the question of how are the sharks offshore using these artificial reefs so that's where sharks came in for me why not <laughs> no, for me, um, so sharks are apex predators. What's the best gauge for any, you know, environment, what the impact is? Look at the apex predators. Therefore, you know, if they're, if they're in trouble, then most likely everything else is in trouble, right? So, and they're really cool. Come on. <laughs> I mean, okay, so I caught a porgy yesterday. Do you care? I caught a white shark. Whoa, wait a second. Hang on. Come here. Let me talk to you. So, yeah, no, I mean, it's just, it's very interesting. It's always been very interesting for me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. 
So I come from a fisheries background, and it's funny because like three years ago I was tagging black sea bass, which is a wildly different tagging <laughs> experience than <Yeah. laughs> um, sharks. You can fit a black sea bass in a shoebox for reference, or at least the ones we were tagging. Um, and so my early interests were very much in you know how are communities and groups of fish interacting with people. And when you ask questions like that, it's hard not to run into sharks. And so, and you know, you keep digging and like Toby said, there's so many species of sharks. They live in so many places. They all do so many things. And when I had this opportunity to like look at um, sharks as another way to measure the ocean, it, it made total sense because, um, you know, like the motivation for my project is like we have all these questions about oceans and like hurricanes is the example. We have all of these like holes in our understanding. It makes a lot of sense to target a group of species that are everywhere and that do so many different things. And when you have that like unique um, relationship with human communities, like they're just really, really cool is what it sums up in. So I, I actually grew up in Western New York. So if anybody hears me talk, I don't really fit in on Long Island. And I've been on Long Island longer now than I've been upstate. So I don't fit in up there either. Um, I was an avid hunter and fisherman up there, freshwater. And when I came to Long Island, because I always wanted to be a marine scientist, um, and then got hired at Southampton High School, where I finally had enough money to buy a boat, because I had really only been surf casting and I was so annoyed that the fish were always like just outside of where I could cast. So I was like, I'll fix them, I'll get a boat. And uh, then they can't get away from me. And so I started out with a very small boat in the bay targeting up uh, porgies and fluke and stuff like that. And then slowly started to work my way up the food chain as the weather got nice and my confidence grew and I started to venture out. And uh, you know, we caught our first shark and it was super exciting crazy. Uh, it was difficult to get crewmen to come out with me on a 17 and a half foot center console to catch sharks, but I was able to get enough that we started catching them. And then I kept in touch with this maniac and, you know, he started planting the seed. He says, you know, he says, you know, you're catching sharks out there. He says, there's, there's really good evidence throughout history that the South Shore of Long Island is a nursery for white sharks. And I was like, like in English. He's like, I don't know how else to say it. I said, you mean great white sharks? He says, yeah, they're the same thing. We don't use great white shark. We use white shark. I said, you mean to tell me I can go out here and catch baby white sharks? He's like, yeah. And he says, if you can, and you can catch them with any consistency, we're going to be on a hell of a ride. And so I was like, all right, game on. I didn't really care what shark species I was catching. And he told me that I could get white sharks. Like, what other shark is there to catch? And so we were set with permits and uh, a pop-off satellite tag in 2015, and we set out to uh, catch and tag our first baby white shark. I set the goal at 50. I figured based on the number of sharks that I had been catching, I said I figured we could probably catch 50, 50 sharks for the season. And it was coming down the home stretch. It was like August 28th. School was starting in two or three days. We had 49 sharks. And I swear, this is not made up story, the 50th shark was that first baby great white that we were able to uh, catch and tag, which was another world first. Wow. So that was our first world first, to be the first ever on planet Earth to put a satellite tag on a, on a young of the year white shark in the Atlantic Ocean. And so that, that started in 2015, this crazy adventure uh, that, that you have all now just been updated on. So in 2015, um, you know, we st the, the, the SOFO shark research experience started, and in only these, these few years, we've gone uh, to amass a powerhouse in, of multiple universities, multiple organizations across the, we, our work here services um, universities and researchers across the country. So um, again, I, I can't thank Frank and the team here enough for, and the, and the members that come and support and keep the museum doors open because you're really doing tremendous groundbreaking work for sharks here on the South Shore of Long Island. Uh, thanks, and I'll get back to Carol's question, why sharks? For me, uh, initially it was very simple. It was, it, was, it was Jaws, seeing Jaws as a kid. <laughs> um, and it wasn't Jaws, it, it wasn't the original Jaws, the good Jaws. It wasn't Jaws 2, it was the worst Jaws movie. It was Jaws 3 that I saw when I was maybe 10 years old. And then that's where I first found out that there were people that had full-time jobs as marine biologists. Um, 
I'd, I'd never really like noticed that before, and I was in like middle school, I think, you know. So I started reading up on what marine biology was all all about, and um, I I I love always loved fishing. I grew up on this great little bass pond, and then I found out that fishing top water for great white sharks is almost the same as fishing top water for largemouth bass. You just use a much bigger jitterbug, right? Um, and so like just the, the thought of doing like that kind of um, uh, just just being able to see these animals and you know, I think Jaws obviously freaked a lot of people out, gave, left a bad taste in their mouth with respect to sharks. I had the total opposite experience. A lot of my colleagues had the same kind of opposite experience where the shark was fascinating and really cool and we wanted to go see them in real life. Um, yeah, so like initially for me, it was it was Jaws that, that sort of got me interested in sharks. And as a kid, I was into monsters. You know, I like Godzilla, thank yeah, you. Exactly. There yeah, we go. There it is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it was... Um, I like dinosaurs, you know, and, and King Kong and Godzilla movies, and uh, and then I found out like sharks were like have been around longer than dinosaurs, and they're still out there, and they're some of them are huge, and there's so many we don't know about, and there's new species discovered every year, um, and there's just you know when I started learning about sharks, there was so little known, um, and so it's been really cool to be uh, to be at this point in my career and and trying to push push the scientific envelope forward a little bit, being on the cutting edge. And some of the stuff we're doing here is legitimately cutting edge um, work uh, with the species here. So um, it's been, the, the whole ride's been fascinating. I'm very lucky to be able to be doing this uh, for a full-time job, but yeah. yeah. Jaws, I found out marine biology was a thing you could do as a grown up, and I was hooked. Yeah, Godzilla's a little hard to find. Exactly. <laughs> I have three questions. One is you ask it, uh, you're saying like there's different sharks that you can like, that are like better or worse for like, for the hurricane thing, and, like predicting what hurricanes are, like what are those qualities that you Great want question. in sharks? Yeah. That's an awesome question. So there are three big qualities. Well, they, so there's, there's two big things and there's three qualities. The first thing is that the shark is going to go where you want it to go. If you're interested in measuring the temperature of the water at the bottom of the ocean, you want to make sure you tag a shark that's going to go to the bottom of the ocean. That's one caveat. If you want to put a tag or measure with a glider, you can control where the glider goes. You can't control necessarily where the shark goes. But we can look at research that's been done and sort of figure out and predict which animals are going to go where we want them to go. So that's the first one. Um, the second one is you want to make sure that the animal is going to um, for our tags, so our tags use satellite transmission, which means that a satellite has to be going over the ocean around the same time that our shark and our tag are gonna be near the surface so that they can communicate to each other and that tag will boost all that cool information to the satellite, which will send it to me. So you need an animal that's going to go where we want it to go and then to go to the surface regularly. And so um, what we've done over the past year and a half is collected all of this satellite data that's been taken um, for sharks on the west coast, um, for white sharks on the east coast, and we've just sort of like boiled down like who, who, which sharks are doing these two things, and are they doing them in the area we want to study? Because uh, I, I learned recently that a thresher shark in the Pacific will act very differently than a thresher shark in the Atlantic. And so, um, yeah, that's just kind of a testament to like, you know, like the, um, just all of the work that this group has been doing, it gives us a lot of information and a lot of opportunities to really answer these questions better. Uh, my second question was, I think Olu, you said that you looked for like how much mobile was in the show. Why is that? Yeah, so, a lot of toxins and things that we've put into the environment, once it runs into the water and kind of smaller fish eat it, it works its way up into bigger and bigger sharks and there's more of it in bigger sharks. So we can use this blood to look at things like that. We can use it to look at so how stressed the sharks are, proteins and hormones. And so there's going to be a lot of other grad students who are going to be looking at the blood and looking at the sharks themselves. Uh, my third question actually relates to uh, one of the questions earlier. I think there actually are wa water bears in New York waters, but they are the, they are microscopic and don't look too much like bears. <laughs> right on, exactly. Harmless water bears.
How many tons of what um, Manhattan would you say are out in the Atlantic? She's, that's a good question. Um, this uh, this gets to a fundamental challenge of fisheries management, which I am well versed. Um, a, a great, uh, a much greater fishery scientist than me once said, um, "Counting fish is just like counting trees, except you can't see them and they move." <laughs> So it is very, very, very difficult to count how many fish are in the ocean of any species. Um, and so there's, there's scientists work on ways to, they assess the socks, they monitor populations, and they can make estimates. I don't know what the numbers are, but you know, there's, there's it, it's come back, it seems like the bunker population has been increasing the last several years, in, at least in New York waters, and uh, there's has to be literally thousands and thousands of tons of them out there. So it's supporting the, the, the entire New York food chain. Anything that, any, almost anything with a mouth bigger than this eats a bunker. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a tough question, and it's something that I think scientists have estimates for, but there's no way to know exactly how many of these bait fish are out there. But the more, the more the merrier for the whole ecosystem. So, so I have a question about climate change impacts. And my concern is that, you know, these shifting nurseries in the future as warm as the climate warms up and nurseries that we've established as white shark nurseries for, move further north and the expansion of wildlife from southern species north, what do you feel is the uh, future for populations of sharks as they move into a northerly expansion and maybe interact with larger prey like other large white sharks that might interfere with the populations and nurseries that have been established already. Thanks, Frank. Uh, great question. Uh, climate change is on a lot, of, a lot of people's minds. That's why we're considering off large offshore wind uh, arrays and things. Um, climate change is happening, and anyone that spends time on the water has seen it with their own eyes in the last 10 years even. Um, species are on the move. All, all, a lot of fish species has been documented have historically have already shifted you know, many degrees of latitude over recent decades. Uh, it's the same with the sharks. Um, right now, with the white shark nursery, historically it was kind of from, you know, uh, like Cape May, New Jersey to Montauk. It's already, that tail end of that nursery area, at the southern end of the New York Bight, is already kind of creeping northward. It's, it's too hot in the summertime now for the white sharks to spend a lot of time off the Jersey Shore. And they're moving further east and east. And historically, that maybe wasn't a big deal. They, they move further east from, from here, they're gonna head over towards the islands and Cape Cod. And um, that used to not be a big deal, but the last 10, 15 years, there's, if you've watched Shark Week or watched the news, Cape Cod has, has a kind of a bustling large white shark population now because the seals have come back. Um, large white sharks will absolutely eat juvenile white sharks. Um, they're not very picky about the smaller sharks they eat and, and big sharks like to eat small sharks. So, Right now, we're at this critical phase. The, the juvenile white sharks off Long Island are kind of between a rock and a hard place. The, the, the temperature is getting warmer at the tail end in the south and pushing them further north. But as they go further north and east towards Cape Cod, they're bumping into potential, potential predators. They're also bumping into more fisheries. They're also bumping into more potential wind farms down the line. Um, so there's more, you know, New England has much larger uh, commercial and recreational fishing um, than a lot of Long Island. So their, their exposure, the pups' exposure to predators and fishing is likely to increase as the climate problem gets worse. Um, and so that's one of the things that we've been able to discern from the tags, from the data we collect, we get temperature data from all the sharks we tag. With those temperature preferences for all those different shark species, we can kind of try to estimate, you know, where are they gonna go in the future? When it, you know, it's, it's almost 80 degrees out there right now. Like 30 years ago, that was not normal. Um, and that's happening more frequently. And so that has consequences. You know, all the fish are moving. It, um, climate change affects different species at different rates and, and some can move. But when you have a juvenile white shark that uh, it's only pre natural predator is a larger white shark and you're pushing, the habitat is being, is sort of pushing them up against their predators. Um, it's, it's not a great outlook, um, you know, for, for the population. So that's just one example with white sharks, but it's a similar case with, with a lot of other species up and down the coast. Um, what, what exactly are, sh I forgot my question actually. We'll do a couple more. So earlier you said that 
don't go swimming if you see dolphins because dolphins would be feeding on the same thing as sharks. Well, if there's dolphins that are eating at the same time as sharks, would the sharks, like, eat the fish and the dolphins? Good question. Again, it depends on the shark. Um, this is why, you know, we can't think of all sharks the same way. So if it's, uh, say it's a sand tiger, sand tiger sharks have tiny, narrow, needle-like teeth. Their, their mouths are designed for only eating fish. Even though they get really big, their teeth can really only um, uh, handle fish. So even though it's a big shark, um, small dusky sharks and things, are, they're gonna be around, they're not big enough to take a bite of a dolphin. But white sharks um, or tiger sharks, if they happen to be around, they, will, they love to eat dolphins if they get the chance. So it depends on the species. So white sharks, yes, tiger sharks, yes. If there's any bull sharks around, they seem really rare still. Um, but uh, those three, the biggest predatory sharks, white shark, tiger shark, and bull shark, love to eat dolphins when they can. And so if they happen to see some dolphins when they're feeding on the bunker, uh, they will probably take a bite. But most of the other shark species out here, they're really designed to eat those small fish and uh, would gen generally leave the dolphins alone. So Brittany, I have a question for you about the Stony Brook grant. We're focusing on three species for the four year grant that we've been that we've been hired to, to document and, and collect data from why are we focusing on sandbar sand tiger and dusky uh, why those three species and not other species yeah you can also throw dogfish in there because these species of sh don't forget them um, but all these species of shark are sharks that we see and interact with offshore and sharks like sand tigers and dogfish spend most of their time cruising along the bottom of the of the sand so and for these offshore wind cables, they're buried below the sand. So that's where the source is coming from. So these are the sharks that are most likely here on Long Island going to come in contact with any source of an EMF. Um, does global warming affect sharks? Yes. <laughs> So generally, in, uh, generally across all sharks and most fish species, as the global oceans are warming, sharks and other species are moving towards the poles. They're moving away from the equator. The water's getting too hot down south, and they're getting pushed further north. So the sharks are heading in heat around here. The sharks are getting pushed northward, especially during the summertime as it warms up in the south. <laughs> Can sharks die from global warming? That's a good question. If it gets too hot, yes, sharks could could die from, from water that gets too hot. But thankfully, most of them can move so they can find cooler water. Um, there's evidence that some uh, some sharks that, have, uh, that lay eggs, if they lay their eggs in a place that gets too hot, that the, the embryos inside the eggs could actually cook. They could get too hot and die. So in the, in the tropics, where there's these egg-laying types of sharks, it can get too warm. There's also ocean acidification, so the pH of the ocean is dropping. And that acidification can eat away at the egg cases, and that can um, add stress to things like skates and sharks that have egg cases in particular. So my job as a fisheries manager is to have long-term sustainability. So we don't necessarily, our phil philosophy with fisheries management is like, it's okay to kill some sharks as long as you don't kill too many. Yeah. The trick is finding out what that, you know, what's too many. And uh, we need a lot of more research to sort of figure that out. We've made a lot of progress. Um, we've really regulated a lot of the fisheries up and down the coast and reduced the numbers of sharks that get killed by fishermen every year along the entire coast for over 40 species that we manage. And so those populations are starting to come back. And so we really need fisheries management to, to, to have and enforce uh, fishermen to make sure they don't catch too many. Good question. What's to account for the um, resurgence of all the bunker fish? You want to take that one? Or? Uh, the bunker? Take the bunker. Take the bunker. Toby's getting a sore throat, I guess. <laughs> Cut that one me. Uh, so just like all the conservation efforts that have been put in place to, that we talked about with sharks, the same sorts of things have been put in place for, for the bunker also. So um, the number of bunker that have been harvested in the past was identified to be a little too much. And so fisheries managers have put uh, changes in rules and regulations in place to help reduce the number of bunker that were being 
harvested, which means there's more of them available to the to Mother Nature. Dr. Curtis, you had mentioned that um, some dogfish sharks uh, who land on the beach uh, are sick, maybe because they were nearby algae blooms. But I didn't know algae blooms could happen in a wide, you know, salt ocean. Is that is that you know more about Habs? Yeah, so um, Habs, once, so when they happen and occur in the bays, they'll come out through the inlets and they'll dissipate quite quickly once they get into the ocean. So the dogfish that are washing up on shore, I would say, probably have been washed also out through the inlet. So you're seeing dogfish that were in the bay washed out into the ocean and then came back on shore. Okay. Sorry. Yep. Toby, what do you think is the most uh, important and surprising result you found from all the staggering? Uh, thanks, great question. Uh, to me, it's it's just the, especially last this past year, last couple of years, just the, the biodiversity and the sheer numbers of sharks that we have access to here. Like historically, we've known these species are here. Like we knew from decades ago that there are white sharks on the South Shore of Long Island. It was only recently we had the technology to put tags on them, track them, and sort of quantify where they're spending their time. But the fact that we can go out right here out of Shinnecock Inlet and catch a dozen species on any given day is, it's, it's awesome to me that we have access to so many different things. We can answer so many different scientific questions. It's just the access to so many different sharks that's really, to me, the most fascinating part of the whole puzzle. Okay, so tomorrow you have a job to do, right? You got to retrieve a cat scan from a tiger shark, yep. correct? Sand tiger. Sand tiger. So uh, yep. with 124 sharks documented already and, and collected data, what's the plan for the rest of the summer? <laughs> I need 21 sandbar sharks. <laughs> we need uh, so so we're we're we are just about out of time for the for the field season this year. Uh, Stony Brook has contact, contracted the SOFO shark team to tag 25 sand bars, 25 sand tigers, and 25 dusky sharks. Uh, we have the 25 dusky sharks, we have the 25 sand tiger sharks, but we've only been able to catch uh, four out of the 25 sand bar sharks. So as soon as I get rid of these scientists and we can get back out on the water, um, we'll be trying to figure out and target the, the sand bar sharks. Another question here? Um, yeah, so since there's two poles, are certain species moving south and certain species moving north to cooler areas? Yeah, um, so it's, it's basically towards the poles. So if they're in the southern hemisphere, like south of the equator, they're moving south. In the northern hemisphere, they're moving away from the equator, they're moving north. Um, so they're like the shark, fish in general, um, and a lot of different marine species are moving just towards the poles, away from the equator. Uh, the equator has taken a lot of the brunt of global climate change and so it's, it's like super hot you know before um, or more very hot more often at the equator and that's just pu pushing everything further away from the equator. Are you guys in touch with anybody that does anything on the southern sector? Um, a, a little bit. I have colleagues in Australia and New, in New Zealand um, and th there's some very similar research um, that we're doing here same type of tag technology happening in Australia and New Zealand um, you know, and, and it's it's really kind of cool to compare. White sharks are there in Australia, yeah. um, as we know, and the juveniles there are hanging out in very similar habitats, the temperature preferences and things as they do here. So it's it's neat that the completely separate genetic population, um, but they still you know they're still the same fish. They still have the same kind of uh, habitat um, and, and, and behavior. Um, would the same species of fish that are like up in the north be moving down to the south from the equator? So you mean like the, the the fish trying to get to cooler water? Would like white sharks also be on the south side of the equator moving south? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So the sharks like in Australia in the southern hemisphere, they're moving south towards Antarctica as the waters get warmer. And uh, here they're moving closer to the Arctic. When the f like when fish are like moving towards like the southern hemisphere to like cooler waters, would the sharks follow them? It's a great question. We don't really know. We need to get more tags on them. 
but that that's it's something that's suggested uh you know as you know so say all the bunkers suddenly just it got too warm and they all moved up up into the gulf of maine um but a lot of things eat bunker and i think that that when the when the moving buffet moves away the sharks are likely to follow it and i think that's part of like what great some of the spinner sharks spinner sharks typically didn't get much further north than delaware during the summer but now there's a huge golden corral of bunker here off New York, they're willing to make that extra couple hundred mile swim to get access to the all you can eat bunker buffet. And so historically that, I don't think that was the case. Occasionally they'd get up here, but now there's so much food. It's, uh, so the food moved, the sharks will follow. And so that's all part of the puzzle, but it's, we still don't have a lot of data on making all of those connections. Any other questions? Let me just say that, you know, for the last several years, this team has not gotten paid for the work that they're doing. This is all volunteer work because of the passion and commitment they have in sustaining shark species. Luckily, through a grant with Stony Brook University this year, we're able to give some compensation to the team, but this is a labor of love for them. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate all the work that you've done over the years to get to this point. And I can't thank you enough. And I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you very much.